we as adults need to unpick our own agenda and say, why am I so bothered by the idea of curiosity? Why am I so bothered by the fact that I feel it's my job to provide activities rather than going, actually, it's my job to step back, step in when I'm needed, but step back and to think then about what I'm and how can I take their inquiry line further forward? Um, so I, I think it's, I think for some people, it's almost they have a growth mindset in their philosophy anyway and in their pedagogy. And that's very easy, therefore, to embrace inquiry based mm-hmm. learning. Um, and other people don't. And, and yeah. they struggle a little bit with that freedom that curiosity demands of us. Hello, and welcome to Blooming Curious a podcast that's all about nurturing that natural curiosity in our early years, kids and students. I'm Edwina, your host from the Ed's Lessons blog, a passionate advocate for play and inquiry and on a mission to keep children curious and questioning. The days of talk and chalk are over. We're diving into the world of integrated, inquiry and nature-based learning and exploring the strategies that create lifelong learners. So if you're a classroom or homeschool educator, or even a curious parent, then this is the place for you. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest on our Blooming Curious podcast. It is Dr. Claire Warden. She is an educational consultant who has developed her approach to nature pedagogy and child-led, child-led inquiry through working in a variety of settings, including her own multi-award winning nature kindergarten, Achlone. And she does advisory work and lecturing in further education. Claire is based in Scotland, but has traveled around the world. Claire is an entrepreneurial leader in the field of nature pedagogy, a prolific author, with her most recent titles being Green Teaching and Beyond the Gate, her innovative work in planning with and for children, as well as nature pedagogy, has led the field for over 35 years which has improved the lives of countless children and families all over the world. Her advisory work to many training groups and as university lecturer is building a legacy of pedagogical skills that place the rights of children and the rest of the natural world at the very heart of her practice. So welcome, Dr. Claire Warden, to Blooming Curious. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely delighted. I'm looking forward to our conversation, Edwina. Great. Let's start off. For those people who don't know, because often when I talk about nature pedagogy, they say, what is that? So perhaps you (laughs) as the expert in nature pedagogy could tell the listeners what nature pedagogy actually is. Sure. Um, So it's the art of being with nature inside, outside and beyond. So, so to unpack that a little bit. So really, I think it is an art form. I think pedagogy is an art form. I think it's, there's an intangibility about the way we work with children that is almost intuitive. And it's about relationship between ourselves as humans, but also about our relationship with the rest of the natural world. Um, and then the idea and concept around inside, outside and beyond has two meanings, actually. The most common one is where I talk about location for learning. So I talk about inside a building. Um, I talk about outside, which is often a landscape space just on your doorstep. And then beyond has become known as beyond the gate, which is going out into a place or an area where there's a sense of wildness, a sense of um, disentanglement, a little bit of of unpredictability, if you like. Um, And then the second meaning of those two words is that inside is yourself, who we are, your soul, your beliefs everything that drives you as a teacher, practitioner. And then outside is your relationship with colleagues about how do we create relationships, communities that wrap around children that are so centered on their needs that they really start to help children flourish. And then the third aspect of that is beyond, which is all my advocacy work, which is beyond as a global community, meaning that if we work together as a global community of educators, teachers, um, everybody really, multi-professional groups, um, we might make a difference for both ourselves as humanity, but also for the rest of the natural world. That's really, really powerful. <laughs> uh, and I think maybe that beyond is the part that I think a lot of people struggle with, right? Because 
mm-hmm. if you just think about the natural world itself, it's that wildness. And I think now, certainly parenting as well as education, there's so much fear around beyond the gate, the wildness. So we wrap kids up and we protect them and we don't want them to experience that or to take risks. And I guess schools are also afraid of, you know, beyond the gate. I mean, you've got to have so many adults per however many kids. You've got to get the ratios right just to go somewhere and leave the school premises, you know, has forms to fill in and all sorts of things. So I guess that's something that we really have to work on as a community to give those experiences to children. Yeah. So, I think we're becoming dwellers. And I think if you become an indoor dweller, it means that you see security in walls. It means that you you dress appropriately for being inside. And, and so when I'm working with schools and settings, you have got to change that practice to really shift to be comfortable outside. And that's why it's a pedagogical approach. It, it can't mm. be something that you do on a Tuesday afternoon. Mm. It has to more be something about the way that we change our understandings of the place of risk in education. It has to be something around the place of empowerment and agency. And in the book, actually, uh, that I wrote with Doug Farker, or edited a beautiful book called Beyond the Gate, um, which is all about the Australian context with a few colleagues internationally. One of the things we were really keen in that book to do was to show and, and uplift, if you like, voices of First Nation peoples, um, so uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, and to really acknowledge this, I suppose, history and tradition that many peoples have had around the world that we really, some of us have lost. And so um, the idea and concept of the beyond the gate as being more dangerous is a very Western idea, actually, because mm-hmm. we've just become indoors and we, we think, you know, that everything out there is going to hurt us. And don't get me wrong, fully aware of all of the mm-hmm. spiders and mm-hmm. all of the snakes and all the crocodiles. So I've got all of that. But, um, you know, if we don't start allowing children to, to come to love the natural world and if we don't start allowing children to take risks, whether that's physical risks, which is like being up there climbing the tree, mm. or even emotional risks about pushing your boundaries, um, or intellectual risk taking, which is all about curiosity. It's all about problem solving and failure and things like that. If we don't embrace risk, then I do worry about where we're going to be as a society in the future. Yeah. I guess without risk, you also don't have resilience, right? Which is a massive, Absolutely. massive thing, right? because a lot of kids lack resilience, they lack the grit. Because I, I think everything's now so fearful, you know. I think risk taking is is a huge component of outdoor learning, and and as you say, just being in nature and having those risks is really important. So I hope that people who listen really rather invite risk because it doesn't mean that you're going to go play in the traffic. It just means no. mm-hmm. it's small amount of managed risk so that you can give children those little mini experiences so that they can build a schema in terms of what risk really is. And, you know, if you fall and you hurt yourself, oh, well, you know, you just get up, dust yourself off and off you go. So Yeah, totally. And, you know, we do have an over-bias on physical risk here. And, you know, within many education programs around the world, it's, it's the physical risk-taking that, that takes up all our attention. And But now, as we've just said, I'm seeing children who <laughs> are emotionally fearful, who won't even really engage in problem-solving, they find curiosity really difficult because they're worried about failure. And if you're curious, it means you might not know the answer. Um, and so, you know, it's not just going to impact the physicality of children. It's going to impact everything around their development, I would suggest. Yes. And really what I'm trying to do is create this awareness of how important it is for children to be curious. And I don't think there is a better place for children to be curious than the natural world. That is where they are most curious because they love being actually outdoors. So I was wondering, how does, and you're probably the the world's renowned expert in this, how does fostering curiosity and fascination, because I know you talk a lot about fascination in children, really contribute, you've, you've touched on it already a little bit, but how does that contribute to their development and the learning experiences that they have, particularly outside in the natural world. How do those two, being outside, think, how, does that, yeah. how does that influence their development and their curiosity and their fascination? Sure. 
I, th- I think one of the, the things that I've come to understand through the research is, you know, the physical research, the, you know, mm. when you're in a setting and you're being critical and, and you're really starting to analyze, I think the indoor space is, is very much more about adult intent. I mean, we've got beautiful examples of provocations being set up and, and they will inspire curiosity, but they have been an adult offering. Yep. When you go outside, there's an unpredictability of the natural world. You can't control when a butterfly is going to appear or when the wind is going to blow. And so I think sometimes that unpredictability of the natural world is the one thing that it's got above all else. You know, you can't control when it's going to rain. You know, all of those different things make it a place of difference. And I think when you can work on a system like nature pedagogy, which links together inside and outside and hopefully beyond, through your documentation, through your intentionality, then I think you help children nurture themselves and that sense of curiosity within them. I also think that the outside is the place where we encounter other living things. I mean, we can have in, you know, indoors, you can have a lovely plant and you might have Mm. a tank with some fish in it. But outside, you know, a beetle that comes around the corner or, you know, you might see a slug or a snail or those encounters with other living things, I think, are, are fairly monumental in children's lives. And I think they then actually help them switch on that curiosity button. And then once that passion is ignited, then I think they start to then transfer that skill from the snail to might be something indoors about how a tower is and why is it stable and why doesn't it fall over. But but if you don't have the understanding of the unknown, of the possibilities of the questioning, then your brain isn't really enveloping the idea of curiosity. Because for some children, sadly, I think the indoor environment has flattened it. It's it's killed what curiosity they're born with because adults, maybe with the best intention, have taken away some of that agency and empowerment and um, really true choice from children. I think we're better now. I think the ideas of uh, Nicholson and play affordances and loose parts and, and all of these other things that are, are really in people's vocabulary at the moment really help. I've been talking to some other guests that I've had recently, a lot of them on loose parts and also outdoor learning in terms of outdoor spaces where children can learn. So that is something that I think is moving in that direction, but, you know, slowly, slowly, and hopefully we'll make some changes and some inroads. As someone said to me yesterday, it's a grassroots movement. You've now, you've mentioned how the indoors is really I guess even though we're putting out all those beautiful provocations, it's the outdoors that really holds fascination for children. Do you think that there are some practical strategies? Because we're seeing a lot of things. I think it's not just because we've also got this homeschooling boom going on as well around the world, especially over COVID, right? Do you think you've got some practical strategies or activities that educators and parents can use to implement curiosity in children in their day-to-day goings-on and their day-to-day dealings and their day-to-day activities? Well, you know, I I think that the first thing is to look to yourself. And and one of the things, if we believe in relationship, then children will seek relationship with you as the practitioner, the educator. And so if you model curiosity, I think that's one of the most powerful things. So of course, you know the answer to things. You know, you're older, you've been on the planet much longer. But if you can then model that, not in a false way, but say, well, I really don't know how that beetle got its name, or I really don't know, you know, why the grass is flowing like that and and moving like that. And and so, you know, you're modeling your own curiosity. And and sadly, again, for some adults, they they maybe have missed that process in their own lives. So they themselves don't feel um, curious about the world around. So, So I think modeling is the first thing I would say. The second is is that whole process of documentation, is the noticing of it. So when um, I talk a lot about fascinations, Mm -hmm. that's really what I'm getting to is that we need to notice those fascinations and they may not be ones that that link or identify with an adult agenda. So I remember working um, with my daughter actually and she was outside playing with a beetle and she loved the beetle, absolutely adored the beetle and she wanted the beetle to go down her slide because it was very important to her. So she picked up the beetle and put him on the slide and he went all the way down. Now, in my brain, I was like, mm, not good for the beetle. 
Um, I wonder what the Beatles thinking. He's going to max down a plastic slide. I wonder if he'll, you know, so I was saying, oh, I wonder if that's comfortable for the Beatle. You know, I wonder maybe we should put him under a leaf now. I think he's had enough of playing. You know, it's all of those semantics, isn't it? And then because they have that mimicry gene, it, it's all about them hearing that in an environment that embraces curiosity. I, I would say that the thing that my daughter, Emily, taught me when she was two was that curiosity, or a sense of wildness, a, a sense of fascination can happen in the smallest of things. It can, you know, when people say to me, I don't have a big outside area, right? You know, I don't know. I've got nowhere for children to be fascinated. I was like, well, you could literally have a planting tray, you know, like a seed tray, and you fill it with a piece of turf and bring that inside if you're someone like, or put it in a window box or, you know, have it in an outside area. You're talking about a very small amount of grass that then children can have the time and the freedom to investigate in the way that they want. And I pretty much guarantee there will be something in that grass, even just a square foot of grass, that will make them curious, that will fascinate them. But it might be just the fact that the end of a stem of grass is a tube. And off we go on a line of inquiry about tubes. But it's come from that initial fascination of the stem of a piece of grass. You know, so it's about the strategies. When people ask me about strategies, I say, well, you know, some of it is you know, this observation. But then for me, of course, it's the enrichment through the talking tub. And the oh. point of my talking tubs is that they, they really stem from these fascinations that children see. So let's take the idea of the tube, all right? So other people might say, well, I'm going to teach about cylinders. I'm going to teach about tubes because it's on my, it's my mathematical curriculum. And I'm like, well, oh, yeah. But there's an awful lot over here that we could explore that's more linked to the idea of tubes and the, of the concept of being cylindrical mm -hmm. um, that stemmed from this child looking at the piece of grass. So what do you put in the talking tub? Well, you can put any kind of tubes in there. It might be photographs of a tunnel that a mole has made or a mouse, or it could be um, the, the tube that's part of a termite mound and you've just got photographs of that. It might be lengths of tubing, flexible and rigid. So your inquiry line has gone from, oh, children are in tubes, to all of these different possibilities. So, I mean, for me, is is important part of the, of the work I do. So that's for you to think about the abstract nature of a concept. And that's where it comes down to your brain. Yeah, it's not like, oh, we're all going to make a tube out of toilet roll. It's, okay, what is the concept of a tube? Well, and what other examples of that can I find in nature that would really inspire children? You know, um, you said tube, and then we're all tornado. Oh, there you go. It seems we've all got such different things. And, you know, the, the tornado experience could see water going down a toilet, all yeah. that and stuff. Yeah. But, but if we embrace that and we document that, which is what the floor books do, if you embrace all of that, then what you're doing is elevating. The children's concepts, you're, you're giving them a voice and you're allowing the creativity to be more visible, which, you know, um, I think is a really important part of, of the work yeah. that we're all doing. Yeah. You know, I am just so happy <laughs> that you said two things because I've been banging on about it like there's no tomorrow over the last, I don't know how many blog posts and podcast episodes. One is that it all starts and ends with us. And two, the power of observation. Because if we aren't curious, as you said, you can't expect kids to be curious. If that kid, and I have actually seen this happen, comes to you with a snail on their hand and you go, yuck, that's disgusting, put her down. <laughs> that is it. It is done. It's over. You know, and I've always said, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's not about you. It's about the children. And our whole purpose is to stimulate and nurture that curiosity and fascination in children. I really feel that as educators, and that includes parents, and that's another thing I keep banging on about, you know, the fact that parents are their child's first educator starts with us. And I'm so pleased that you said that, <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Yeah. No, it's okay. And I think, you know, it does, you know, there's all sorts of big questions, aren't there, around how do we support our colleagues to become curious? And I think, you know, I've done courses now for many years and, and I think that there's almost, um, 
an undoing of some of the messages they've been given. You know, so the ones I've loved have been the joint courses and courses that have lasted for maybe a week, you know, and it's an indulgent, I know, with current budgets. But, you know, in those, what, what you do is you start off and people say to me, well, what's the activity? I say, well, I don't know what you think the activity is here. You know, you've got stones or you've got wool or you've got these natural fibers. What do you think we could do with them? And there's a real push to give me the activity. Tell me what to do. And I think for sometimes in training, what you then have to do is allow people to go through that discomfort almost of going, but I don't know what to do. Okay, well, let's think. Because my mum used to say, boredom is the stimulus for creativity. Hmm. And I think sometimes we worry about giving both ourselves and children time to be bored, time to <laughs> get a bit frustrated and, 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 you know, unpick what's this naughty problem? I don't know what to do. And we give them the answer too quickly. And so I think you're absolutely right. We as adults need to unpick our own agenda and say, why am I so bothered by the idea of curiosity? Why am I so bothered by the fact that I feel it's my job to provide activities rather than going, actually, it's my job to step back, step in when I'm needed, but step back and to think then about what I'm and how can I take their inquiry line further forward? Um, so I, I think it's, I think for some people, it's almost they have a growth mindset in their philosophy anyway and in their pedagogy. And that's very easy, therefore, to embrace inquiry based mm. learning. Um, and other people don't. And, and yeah. they struggle a little bit with that freedom that curiosity demands of us. Mm -hmm. I think as well, where a lot of practitioners struggle is that inquiry can be quite chaotic. And as an educator, you don't want someone walking in, you've got, you know, 25 kids in all directions and, you know, you're sort of herding cats a little bit. And I think they feel like, oh, no, this is, it's, it's not a good look, you know. But for some of us, it's just, yeah, it's okay. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. And you know what all the children are doing and they're all working at their own things. And there's, a, there's this hum, it's just this beautiful hum that, that takes place and you, you know, okay. They're, they're absolutely engaged. But getting there can be quite chaotic. I think it's just about trust and being brave and just pushing through that little bit of pain in the beginning. And it, it all comes together beautifully, as you've said. Um, Claire, you touched on one of the most important things, I think, part of your work, which is really the concept of the whole talking tubs and floor books, really. And as you said, your talking tubs, if you were talking about tubes, you'd have all those elements in it. So you've always used talking tubs really as a provocation, right? So your, that's your provocation is your talking tub to, to start off the whole thinking process. And then, of course, the floor books really is how you make your learning visible and how you capture children's curiosity. Is that my, I'm, I'm saying the right yep. thing, right? Absolutely. Just Absolutely. to make sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. No, you're, you're, and there's, yeah. there's you're, also now people also having, there's a lot of work in that field, which is amazing as well, is making that learning visible through learning walls. But I think learning walls and floor books ultimately are one and the same thing. They're, they're doing the same thing. Would you agree or would floor books be really much better for those kids because it's sort of that whole tummy time thing as well and where they can really document where you can really document their wanderings, their fascinations going forward and use it, of course, most importantly, as a planning tool. I think it's the difference. I mean, Lillian Katz in the States, um, she did a lot of work around learning rules because what she felt for their context in America was that something on display would be more effective. And so the learning walls idea is indeed, it's about a journey. You're doing a starting point. It was, she'd seen some work done by Loris Malaguzzi and Reggio Emilia. And so she'd embraced that, but put it into the American context. And so the learning wall indeed shows the journey, shows some of the, that learning. Often when I've seen learning walls, they are adult created display. Oh, yeah, and that's the difference. Making yeah. that, yeah. The floor book is about planning with and for children. So children have a higher level of agency and empowerment. They're meant to write into the books. They could cut the photographs out themselves. And the adult, what the adult's doing is really monitoring flow and direction. 
They're monitoring things like challenge. They're monitoring engagement from children. So they're used almost as an aspect of quality assurance because there's got to be a system. If you're going to do an inquiry-based approach, which is all about curiosity, learning, and things like that, then the, the floor book is, the talk and thinking floor book, is all about guiding that without overly directing it. So I've always done the analogy of, of a bit of a river. And so if you imagine you have a spring at the top, that's that initial fascination. And then we, you know, we come down and it's a little bit turbulent in the first stages of a, of a river, streams burbling, and there's lots of things, all children's voices quite fascinated mm. by lots of different things. And then the flow starts to really emerge. And the flow is the thing you talked about, which is you go from a sense of, of um, lots of different things all happening into this more solid, smoother line of inquiry, if you like. And in that big river, then that's the direction you're changing the direction of the river slightly by the use of the talking tub. So if I was, for example, to observe, so we'll take the analogy of the tubes again, one of the children became fascinated by building tunnels and they've been showing it in the block play area. They've been making tubes out of cardboard. They've been really fascinated by the speed of the, the way that the water moves down, the guttering tunnels outside. You're seeing this repeated fascination. What I would then do is adjust the contents of the talking tub to have more stuff in it that will go deeper into the idea of tunnels and structures and how we could make them of different sizes and things like that. So the talking tub isn't just used once, it's oh. used and adapts all the way down that river. And then the boulders in your big river are you. You're the adult. I mean, you, you affects the learning process, whether you like it or not. You're bound to, whether you're a teacher in a primary school or you're a practitioner in an early years environment, you are there and your interactions will be adjusting the learning. So we meander down this river, yeah, and we get to a point in the river where there's maybe a dam. And the dam for me is quite interesting in planning because I often think people plan for six weeks or they plan to the half or they say, well, I'm planning for a term. So we have these quite artificial blocks in our learning planning or planning for learning, um, which I call a dam. Yeah. Now, if you're a child with special educational rights, you may only just have switched on to the concept of tunnels about two weeks before the end of term. And so you're, but you're enthused and you're curious about tunnels now. But if you think about it as an adult thing, you're about to stop your mm. inquiry around tunnels and tubes and go on to something else. Well, if you put it in the talking tub, if you put it in the, sorry, in the floor book, Floor books are in your book corner. They're mm -hmm. meant to be read, revisited a lot by children. That means that if that child with special educational rights comes in after the holiday and says, you know, I went to France and I went through a tunnel in my car and my mum said it was the longest tunnel ever, whatever, you then take that child back to the original floor book and date it and say, actually, Johnny's come in with this. So so in every dam system on a river, there's always the outflow. There's always these little trickles of water that keep on going. And that's children who sustain um, a fascination for longer than others. It's for children who have special rights, who just need longer to maybe to get to the depth they want to explore. So, so the difference for me is that the, in summary, really, I suppose, is that the floor books have this long flow of learning that might take a year, might be. Six months, it might be just that it's three weeks. So they are differing time frames. They are held in the place of children, which is on the floor usually, uh -huh. presented very easily to parents. They're kept almost as a quality assurance process. So what I encourage settings to do is to keep the first floor book they did and keep maybe the one from the third term. And then as they do it, they can then show anybody coming to visit very easily, look, this is our improvement journey. This is what we've been doing. And at the back of the floor books, don't forget, mm. that's where you're putting your curriculum outcomes. So you're always tracking back to curriculum and being held accountable to curriculum, which I think eases teachers and practitioners a little because some of the very open-ended inquiries can take you off in so many different directions. So the banks of your river, if you like, are a little bit more defined by your talking tub. And you have evidence of that that is accountable to a curriculum. So it just helps people relax a little bit more. Now, 
I just want to touch on one thing there. I'm just mm-hmm. thinking in terms of teachers in classrooms. You know, they're so accountable to the curriculum. They're so held accountable to the curriculum the whole time. And I think a lot of educators are afraid to diverge from that because the curriculum now is, I don't know about in England and Scotland, but I, I guess it's very similar. It is so overcrowded for children now. And so teachers, I think, are always just thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to get through this curriculum and all the content. How do I fit in the science and the, the social studies? How, how, do I, how do I fit all this in? And I've always thought, well, you know, inquiry, you know, Kath Murdoch said that so beautifully. It's not a separate subject. It's a mindset. It's a stance that we take. But I think a lot of teachers still need that reassurance that, yes, we can do this, but we can still meet curriculum outcomes, even though we're going down this floor book and we're going down this provocation and we're going down this inquiry path. What would you say to educators to sort of ease their anxiety and stress around that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, inquiry is, is a pedagogical approach to the way that you work with children. I think that, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm going to do inquiry on Tuesday afternoon. Mm-hmm. It has to be the, the philosophy of your classroom or the, of your setting. I think, you know, there's no reason. For example, I'm working with a group right now and they are looking at mathematics teaching. And the research says that we can do direct teaching of core skills in maths. Absolutely. We can do that and we'll do it fast. But what we're finding is the retention, the passion, the understanding of the applied status of the maths has been overlooked because people are going too fast. So what we're now doing is saying, okay, you teach the mathematical concept or any concept in any subject, to be honest with you. And then what the floor book does is document the ap- application of that. So say, for example, I don't know, you were looking at measure, all right? And, and a classic one for us was that the children had decided that, you know, we taught them about the measure, we taught them about centimeters, half meters, all that. And then they had to make their own measuring sticks to go out to, because we were going for a walk and it, the puddles were on the way. So we wanted to make puddle measures. So that part of it is the bit that I want to document children's understanding of a concept or a skill or a piece of knowledge in context. And it's only really then we can see whether or not they truly have learned it. Now, you can't do that all the time because that's when we end up, we run out of of time. So what you do is you, as a teacher in a classroom, you might say, right, well, my lens this term is going to be on the inquiry and the child's theories around maths. Or I might be looking at some interesting stuff coming out of science. So let me have a little look at that. And so you develop in in the primary school, you might develop more of a lens where you're really focusing on an aspect. So it could be an overt curriculum area, or it could be the interdisciplinary themes. It could be something that crosses across the whole of your curriculum, which of course is in the Australian curriculum. Um, I mean, it's lovely to see that the EYLF now has actually Mm -hmm. written in talking, thinking for all books. So I'm very excited to see the work yeah. in there. So there's obviously people are embracing this idea of inquiry, I think, a little bit more now than that, than I've seen, you know, 30 years ago. They are. But do you also seeing on the other side of the coin, everybody's going, oh, but what about explicit instruction? What about explicit instruction? Yep. So that's a massive mm-hmm. thing as well, because if they think that if they're going to embrace inquiry, they have to lose explicit instruction. So they're not quite seeing that the two actually dovetail. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the key thing, isn't it? It's like in the, the early 70s, there was the whole idea that children just could float in and they would absorb what they needed to know. And, and the researchers actually said, no, that's not true. So there was a really good piece of work done by um, Imran Blatchford. And um, she looked at the idea of the, the significant adult, the EPI project. And, and the adults make a difference, as you've already said, Edwina. You know, the adults are there. We're not there just to supervise. Um, we are there to interact, to plan, to talk about how we can scaffold that learning, making sure there is obviously still time for children initiated work. But um, it's that pedagogical dance. It's the two things coming together that I think make the difference. That's really powerful. And I think, as you've said in the beginning, we as communities and even as a school community, from leadership down, I think there has to be a cultural shift, a cultural shift in, within schools, within communities, within society to actually place more of an emphasis on curiosity. Most people really aren't as lucky as Ochlone to be in a beautiful outdoor setting. 
What if they're in an urban environment? Is it just bringing in that pot plant or is there more that they can do? I think, um, I think what you have to do is to look at the, um, the natural world, I suppose, in, in an elemental kind of way. So if you took the four elements of fire, earth, air and water and say to yourself, all right, how are those four elements displayed at, at Auckland? Well, you know, we are lucky. We have dappled light from the forest mm. and we have a stream. We have water flow and we have lots of rain. So, so it's very easy in that space. It can also be very hard because... You know, in February, it's freezing cold and we get wet rain. Um, so if you take that then and say, okay, what does that look like inside? Well, the fire, the light becomes the fireplace maybe, or it might be a yes. candle. Um, it would just be the, the light table that you've got. And the water, well, that becomes maybe, a you know, I've seen people who've put trickle fountains in. I've seen other people who've just literally done a beautiful soundscape around birdsong and water inside. So. I think there's huge amounts that we can do, but again, it comes back to creativity. It comes back to um, the idea that it's okay to do that. Whereas, you know, when I say to people, why can't you put a recorder device by your bird table and pipe it directly into your playroom? Why can't you do that? And they're like, well, because we didn't think we could. Well, yeah, mm. you can. Why not? You know, mm. so putting sand on the floor, putting muzzle, there's, there's huge amounts. And I do think you know, there's been a big uptake in things like, the, you know, a lot of the Nordic philosophies around mm -hmm. Bushkinder and philosophical that are ancient First Nation thinkings. And then you've got, you know, even down to shops like Ikea, who are like always advocating natural materials. So we've got the idea of this kind of biophilic design, which is what we see in Roger Amelia as well, which is these these very earthy shades and we use baskets and we bring in stones. So we've got the aesthetic. It's then using that environment effectively, which is really what the nature pedagogy is about. So you need to do the two things together. I think the pedagogical belief structure and the beautiful environment. And when you get those two right, then you get a lovely synergy there happening, which yeah. Yeah, I think is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Beyond the Gate. But I also received this little guy in the mail, your book. <laughs> Actually, I arrived today. I haven't had a chance to read it, um, but I've <laughs> read a few little synopsis online. Green teaching, nature pedagogies for climate change and sustainability. What was your inspiration for that? And tell us a little bit about the book. Sure. It's actually, um, a lot of it was based around the research from my doctorate studies, my PhD. And um, what I was looking at was was the theorization, if you like, and the creation of nature pedagogy um, within the context of the work I was doing. And it, it became very apparent that I aligned very closely with First Nation theories and ideas. Um, and one of the things that links them very closely is the idea of climate change and sustainability. So nature kindergartens and forest schools and bush kindies and things, are sustainable models because they place the rights of the natural world and humans, obviously, which is part of the natural world, in the middle of all of that. So if you can then um, sort of take the ideas, I suppose, around that and live in that way and be in that way, then it means that your carbon footprint is low. It means that you're really thinking about your purchasing powers. And so there are quite a lot of graphics in the book that help people see why nature pedagogy is going to be the way that we're going to need to work if we're going to have an impact on climate change. And sustainability has been on people's agendas a long time, but it's almost been, well, I do a worm farm and, um, you know, I collect the litter and I recycle that and that's fabulous. But again, if, it, if we embrace a, a way of being, a way of teaching, a way of educating that places the rights of nature and humans in the middle of it, then then it's going to be good for us and then we'll have a planet to live on. So the more I started to research and the more I started to write, the more I thought actually nature pedagogies um, are the way forward for us. And so it's something that every teacher can do, every educator can do, because it is a ground up. You said that earlier on in the podcast. It's like it's a ground up movement. And so if we all make little changes to the way we teach, if we all think about the natural world in the 
the work that we're doing with children, then then it spreads across into the next generations. So that's that's what the book was about, green teaching. Mm. Right. I think yeah, I'll link it all in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, I think just to finish off, is there anything else that you feel is really important, a real important message to leave with people? I think to trust in yourself. I think um I think we're incredibly talented and skilled profession, actually, that is sometimes undervalued. But that sense of um, allowing yourself some freedom to think about what if, what if I was to do this? What if this happened? And allowing that divergent thinking to come into your practice a little bit more. Um, I think we could allow our own creativity and curiosity to flourish, and that would make us perhaps a happier profession, um, but certainly make it much more engaging for young children. I will put everything in the show notes, but would you like to just tell people where they can get hold of you? And I know you have on your website beautiful courses people can sign up to do. You've still got amazing books and loads of resources. So tell people where they can get hold of you. Sure. The, obviously, Google Meister is the one. Mm-hmm. Find me on Google and just Google my name. But the main website is Mind Stretches Academy. And on Mind Stretches Academy, there are lots and lots of online courses about all aspects of practice, but it's core belief structure really is around nature pedagogy and documenting through floor books. Dr. Kane Warden, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today, an honor and a privilege. So thank you very much for Thanks. being here and for just your inspiration. And you really are an inspiration, certainly to me, because it was through you that my whole pedagogy changed and I'm forever grateful for that. So thank you very much for being on Living Curious today. And I hope that everybody listening really has benefited from your absolute awesomeness. Thank you so much for having me, Adrena. Let's keep in touch.